Hello and welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. This is a Bible study. We're going through the book of Acts. We're in chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at just five verses in this program. And by the way, this is the book of Acts number 37 in our series. Now, there will be approximately 100 programs before we get all the way through this book because we go verse by verse, a little bit at a time. I feel that my job is to be a teacher. I like to teach the scripture. It's got everything in it that you need, and it's the best book anyone will ever read, actually. Just love reading it. It's been an important part of my life since I became a Christian in 1963. So we're doing verse-by-verse verse Bible study. Now, here's the program today. It's called James Killed and Peter Imprisoned. Now, James and Peter, these are apostles. Uh, they are both uh, one of the 12 disciples or apostles that Jesus called to himself to teach them during the three or so years of his earthly ministry. James. His last name is Zebedee. He has a brother by the name of John. And they were characters, by the way. They were real characters. Now, Luke, in the book of Acts, he, he has first. He covers the first Pentecost, the first awakening, the first major outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, his second first was the first martyr, or a person killed because he believed in Jesus, and that was Stephen, who was uh, stoned to death. Um, and so we have the first apostle killed. So we've got these first. And uh, so Luke does this. Now we're going to find that um, it's a short little piece, but there's a lot connected to it. So uh, another one of Luke's first. Now into chapter 12, verse 1. It says, About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. First of all, I want to explain what the word um, church means. And uh, it's from a Greek word that if you would pronounce it, take the Greek letters and put English letters, it would sound like ekklesia. Uh, the ek is a preposition, means out, out of. And ekklesia is from the word to call, it means to call out. So the church is those who are called out. And you've heard me a number of times distinguish between what is called the visible church and the invisible church. The invisible church, that's the one that counts. Now that's those who are actually followers of Jesus who have been born again by the Spirit of God. And the visible church is made up of all kinds of people. They are not necessarily Christians at all. And um, people get confused about that. But by joining a church or being baptized doesn't make you part of the church. If, if this is the first time you've heard that, you're scratching your head. Uh, I know. What we call Christianity or Christendom would encompass everybody, everything. And I've known some awfully wonderful people who have never been born again or part of churches. Uh, I was one myself for a period of about nine months. And uh, my dad before me uh, was actually a member of Baptist churches for several decades before he actually became born again Christian. And that is very characteristic. Uh, in the first Great Awakening in America along the, uh, among the colonies, a population then of about one million people, Jonathan Edwards taking over for his grandfather Solomon Soddard at the Northfield, Massachusetts Congregational Church, he knew that most of the people in that church were not actually Christians. Uh, in that day, to vote, to almost do anything, you were a member of a church. The charters were given to religious organizations like the Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, Reformed, et cetera, et cetera. And so everybody pretty much was a member of the church. And Jonathan Edwards realized, wait a minute, uh, these people aren't actual Christians. 
the Christians in name. They would identify themselves as Christians. They're members of the church. They'd been baptized, but he knew they weren't actually born-again Christians. So he began to preach for awakening. And that is how the first great awakening in America took place. 1735 it began. So, so we, we know that there's a visible church and the invisible church. The invisible church is known to God alone. He called them out and called these people to himself. So that's the church, this early church. And this is the church in Jerusalem. Um, uh, the year is about 44 A.D. And we're going to have a little bit more about the story. About that time, the word time here is kairos, not chronos. Chronos is chronological kairos. And uh, it is a, a certain special time. About that time, Herod the king. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Herod. This is Herod Agrippa I. He's the grandson of Herod the Great. His father was named Aristobulus. And uh, this Herod Agrippa I was born in 10 B.C. His father, Aristobulus, uh, died just three years later in 7 B.C. Uh, he considered himself Jewish. On the, his mother's side, uh, they were Jewish. The women were Jewish, and so he considered himself to be Jewish. He was very loyal to Rome. Uh, he was uh, helped in his political career by both uh, emperors Caligula uh, and Claudius. And uh, he favored them, and uh, so he had some political clout. He was unscrupulous, however. He treated people badly, but he was very religious. Uh, throughout his life, uh, he would attend the temple, sacrifices in the morning and the evening. He would go to um, uh, Saturday morning services. He would read scripture uh, in synagogues and so on. Uh, so he was very, very religious. He's also very political, and the combination is not so good. One of the great things that the early church in America did was uh, want the separation between church and state, particularly the Baptists and the Jews. Uh, they teamed together and uh, were able to do that. Unlike Islam, by the way, who ha is all one, uh, politics and religion, the church and state, all one to be ruled over by Sharia law. But in any case, uh, the, uh, uh, this was the circumstance in Jerusalem at that period of time. There was a tremendous connection between the political structure and uh, Judaism. And so we had persecution, and of course there's going to be persecution. Uh, almost every religious group had been persecuted at different times. And this just goes with it. There's no more significant identity, perhaps, than those two, religious and political. We take that so seriously, uh, way too seriously, in, in my opinion, particularly in the, uh, in the political arena. And, uh, but here you had persecution, one of the first persecutions that took place in the church. Uh, not the first, because it was Stephen, and Paul was about his persecuting business as well. But the persecution is, is always going to be taking place. Uh, people say, why can't we just all get along? Why can't we just all love each other and get along and have everything fine like uh, the interfaith communities would like to see happen? Oh, that would be nice, but, you know, if, if it assumes that, well, we all just have some truth and all our paths are okay, but we know better than that. There's the marked differences between the groups. If you're right, I'm wrong. And, and you have a sense of that. And uh, when I debate with Muslim scholars and so on, when I'm hoping to do that, I have a little bit of a taste of it now, uh, we both know that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And we always assume that we're the right ones. Now that just goes with the territory. And so we're going to find that in the history of the world, uh, 
ancient, and now there's going to be persecution. Um, one of the interesting things is Jesus said to love those who persecute you. Here's the exact quote, Matthew 5, 44. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. A great passage, Matthew 5, 44. And uh, we do. We understand that this goes with the territory. There's different kinds of persecution. Some can be direct, the violence. Uh, there can be kind of social uh, intimidation, exclusion from certain venues, and uh, even financial pressure. Uh, so there's various forms of persecution that take place. So about that time, here the king laid violent hands. Now here is a, a direct violent form of persecution on some belong to the church, on some. Uh, not sure exactly why that is just some. We're not told, but anyway, verse 2. He says, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. With the sword, by the way, means beheaded. Some, I, I read one commentator that said, well, they had their uh, throat slit. But in general, I think I would go with the idea of beheading. That's what the little phrase, by the sword, would mean. He didn't run them through. Uh, but uh, anyway, there's the possibility of uh, throat slitting. But anyhow, he killed James. Now, this James, I said his last name was Zebedee. He and his brother John, uh, John, he, who wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, uh, John was his younger brother, James was the older brother. And they were a couple of characters. Um, they had the nickname of Sons of Thunder, uh, where uh, when they were going through Samaria, they encountered a little bit of difficulty. And James and John said, well, we ought to have fire cast down and consume these people. Well, Jesus dealt with that. But there's another instance that's very, very significant. And I'm hoping to find that because it's important. I, I have. I found it. What do you know? It's in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 35. I'm going to give you a little background on James. It says in Mark chapter 10, verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him, that's Jesus, and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want? me to do to you. And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Now they knew who Jesus was. They'd been with him long enough. They knew he was the Messiah. They knew, well, they speculated about what was coming and they wanted in on it big time. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, <clears throat> the cup, the cup of suffering, uh, the baptism, the baptism of suffering and death. Uh, and those, that's what Jesus is talking about. Uh, Jesus knew what was coming. Uh, Jesus knew about his dying on the cross. It had long been prophesied in Scripture, very clear. The Messiah would die. Uh, just to check on that to see if I'm correct, um, read Psalm 22 and Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, that Jesus died is a bigger problem for a lot of people than his resurrection. Uh, the reason that the death is such a big deal is because that is the heart core of Christianity. Because it's in his dying that we die to sin. That our, the blood that he sheds cleanses us from sin. And so the Gnostics early on, 
They said, well, it wasn't really Jesus who died. It was somebody in his place, Simon of Cyrene. Or they said that uh, somebody just looked like Jesus and Jesus took off, stood off to the side and uh, uh, laughed at him. And, and some come up with the swoon theory, the idea uh, that uh, uh, Jesus survived the cross and eventually recovered and disappeared. And then his disciples claimed that he had been raised from the dead. By the way, there is no record of anybody surviving a Roman crucifixion. Jesus was almost dead by the time he got there after the scourging, which often killed people. Now, Jesus died on the cross. That is the core of it. Prophesied a thousand years before, 750 years before. It was very well accounted for, well known that Jesus had died. Pliny the Younger writes about it in about the year 117, talking to Emperor Trajan, I believe, or what happened during, uh, yeah, during age, uh, Emperor Trajan's rule uh, that Jesus, somebody named the Christ, had been executed under Pontius Pilate. So we know this. And, uh, and so here's James He's looking at the power thing. You know, just because somebody's a Christian doesn't mean they do everything right. Just because somebody is a called apostle doesn't mean they got it straight. It our growing up into Christ, learning the scripture, becoming as much we can like Jesus as followers is a long and slow maturing process, just like growing up as a human being. And James, I would say, being a follower of Jesus only a few years, maybe he is in his, spiritually speaking, his early teenage years, max. So, but now here he is. He's picked out to be killed. Nobody knows why. Uh, well, James was fairly big in the early church. Uh, he was one of the inner three. The inner three disciples of Jesus were James and John and Peter. These were the, the inner three. They were the only ones with him on the Mount of Transfiguration and a couple of other circumstances where they alone were with Jesus. So maybe that's why they knew that Jesus had, uh, James had a bit of a higher uh, association and identification as an early follower of Jesus. So anyway, that's what they did. And then it says, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Okay, here we go. Now, the other one that of the inner three they didn't was John, because John was a kid. Yeah, he was probably a mid-teenager, max, at this particular point. So the two older inner circle apostles, now Herod uh, Agrippa I is going after him. He kills James, okay, he saw that it pleased the Jews. Okay, when we say the Jews, that is not to use that in a disparaging way. It is a descriptive way of speaking. Um, James himself was Jewish. Peter is Jewish. All the early church, totally Jewish. So it's not that way. He's referring to the power, uh, the power structure, the Sanhedrin, the Council of the Seventy. Um, elders ruled over by uh, the high priest. This is who Luke, uh, Luke is referring to. So he arrests Peter. Now this was during the days of unleavened bread, uh, Luke informs us. Now, uh, this is one of the spring feasts, the spring feast. Uh, we, we're, right now we're in uh, October. We just finished um, the uh, high holy days of Israel, the fall feast, first is uh, Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, and then came Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement, and then the third uh, was Sukkot, or ingathering, or tabernacles. And those were the three fall feasts that everybody was called to observe, uh, still to this day. And then uh, the spring feasts, which are coming up, are Passover, Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and the Day of Pentecost. Now, in the days of Jesus, and you'll see it in this little paragraph, 
that the word Passover and unleavened bread were used synonymously. Passover was one day, and the very next day to Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, last seven days. And they would, if you said Passover, it meant both. If you said unleavened bread, it meant both. Okay, I don't want to belabor that one. So this was during the days of unleavened bread. Now, it's because of that event that basically saved Peter's life. Um, Verse 4 says, And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Okay, now there's a whole lot of material there. Uh, So we have the situation. Peter is arrested, first day of unleavened bread or first day of Passover, something like that. And so there he is. Uh, And we remember that... uh, this was a dangerous time. The, the place is filled. Jerusalem is filled with people, just, just overwhelming numbers of people. Uh, the uh, the uh, population of Jerusalem would increase um, by uh, about uh, equivalent of times 10. Uh, so we're maybe in the neighborhood of close to a million people are flooding in. They're living all over the place there to observe the great uh, feasts and festival at uh, the temple in Jerusalem. So it was too dangerous to do something like this to someone who was probably pretty well known now. Uh, the church probably numbered someplace around seven to 10,000 people, which it's difficult to know. 3,000 were converted at one time. Later on, there was, it added up to about 5,000. And this is sometime later now. Time has gone by. And uh, maybe as long as 10 years. And so there's a fairly large number of of people in uh, Jerusalem uh, that are believing that Jesus is the Messiah. So it would be dangerous to put the number one guy to death at that particular time. So squads of soldiers, the way this kind of breaks down uh, as it goes, which is fairly normal, there would have been four groups of four, 16 all together at minimum, Now remember that the disciples had been arrested before uh, and they they got out of prison. They miraculously all got out and ended up preaching in the temple and all big big hullabaloo uh, broke out on that one. But they weren't in the inner prison. There were two prisons at that period, uh, we are to understand from uh, various writings like Josephus and other documents of the of that period. One was a kind of a holding tank uh, that you weren't, it wasn't, you know, a heavily guard behind bars. The place where Peter is, is the inner prison. It's maximum security, max security. So he's being carefully guarded. He's going to have chains on his wrists. Okay. We're going to find out later on. So So that's what it says. So verse 5 says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. We want to remember that as we get uh, to the next story, uh, which we're going to talk about the rescue of Peter and that that whole dramatic experience. So, um, So the days of unleavened bread, Peter... They don't want to cause any disruption at this point. Dangerous to kill him at that time. And uh, so we have this situation. So he's secured in prison, Peter is. Um, uh, By the way, and it's one of the curious things, Peter is going to escape. We'll find that next week. And the Roman law was that if you were guarding a prisoner and they escaped, you were you were executed. And we're going to find out in verse 19, which we'll be getting to next week, but I'm going to read it now just to complete the story. It says, And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered them that they should be put to death. Uh, That always shocked me. Here it is that one person is rescued 
and the rest of them, numbering approximately uh, at least uh, 16, would have been put to death, uh, and probably the same way that decimation took place by the slitting of the throat. What a, what a terrible thing, and you think, my goodness, is this a just God? Uh, if, if you were to think that, you'd be following in my own th thought pattern as well. Uh, many times we really can't figure out why God does stuff, and it seems strange to us. But we have to remember that God is, is establishing his called out ones. This is a huge, a huge event, uh, the, the greatest event to take place in the history of humankind in my opinion and the opinion of many others. And so it, we have a larger picture to see, a larger picture. Um, so it says that a prayer is being made for him. The church is praying. We would like to know what that praying looked like. Always wondered, how did it, what did it sound like? What did they do? Did they stand up and do this? Did they get on their knees? Did they prostrate themselves? Probably they stood up like this, uh, which was the typical Jewish way of praying. So they're, they're praying. Notice it says earnest prayer. Uh, I wish Luke and some of the gospel writers would have given us a little bit more material. It would have been so interesting, but uh, they didn't. Um, so uh, we also have to ask, why, did, why was Peter rescued and James was not? See, it's the second issue that we get from this little story. Uh, Peter's going to be rescued. James is beheaded. James, Zebedee, one of the inner three. How come him? And Peter uh, is, is rescued. Well, we don't know the mind of God. Somehow we will look, at, sometimes we look at things, we'll, we'll have another idea of how things should be. But, you know, our, a little humility really helps uh, that we don't exactly see things from an eternal point of view, from what God is doing from the beginning. And, um, and so we have, we have these question marks uh, that come up to us, and I can't help but think about them uh, when I look at this passage. Uh, why, uh, why are the 16 Roman soldiers killed and why is James killed and not Peter or vice versa? All right, the questions remain. It's good to answer and ask, rather, it's good to ask the questions. So long.